Okay, thanks. Thanks very much for the invitation, and I, uh, I hope that my talk is not too far afield from the interest of, uh, of, of the people here. I want to talk about water, and water is something that is so familiar to all of us that you would never imagine that there could be anything interesting to say about the subject. You'd think that everything is known that should be known. And I want to try to demonstrate to you that that's not the case at all. Good morning. Um, and uh, just to start off with something familiar, so you, you've all seen a picture like this. Uh, this is a cloud sitting above the water, and you think that the water is evaporating from all areas of the water, yet often you see a single cloud or two clouds forming at discrete points. And so the question is, what's happening to all those other water molecules that are evaporating and rising? What force directs them to, uh, to, to that particular location? Uh, just a, a sort of teaser. Okay, so we start off with the idea that water is um, a, a dipole, a positive region and a negative region. Um, and you can represent that, for example, like a, a bean with a positive charge and a negative charge. And if you, if you then ask the question, well, what happens when you have a surface that may contain charges and such? What happens to this dipole? And you you can imagine what might be the case, that this dipole will be directed toward that surface. And so it might adsorb onto the surface, and then other dipoles would adsorb onto that particular dipole. And if you have a lot of charges on the surface, what you'd expect is that these charges would line up and would organize themselves in, in some way. The uh, extent of the organization might be limited to a few molecular layers because the effects of thermal motion would then tend to disrupt any kind of ordering. And the general view uh, among surface chemists is that once you get beyond two or three molecular layers, there's no order that's left. So this is the currently accepted view. And what I'd like to demonstrate to you today is that that view is wrong, is entirely wrong. And that what actually happens is that the organization extends, the ordering extends very far from, from the nucleating surface. And that that organization has everything to do with the properties of water that we know about. OK. So the first idea was to test for solute distribution. What do I mean? What I mean is that if you start with a surface that, uh, or an entity that looks like this with a surface and some sort of organized water, if you were to put solutes in this water, you'd expect that the solutes would be excluded from the ordered region because of energetic reasons. On the other hand, farther from the surface where the water molecules are free to hydrate those solutes, there should be plenty of solutes. So if you, if you put solutes in, or actually we use particles to start with, solutes later, if you put them in, you'd expect that if there's any uh, is that if you'd find some exclusion, for example, in this region, you could say at least hypothetically that maybe the region of order would extend from here to here. So that, that's, those are the first experiments that we did. And we started out using a gel. So we took a gel, and the first one we used was polyvinyl alcohol, common gel. We put it into a chamber, and uh, whoops put it into a chamber, and then we added a suspension of microspheres. Microspheres are just little spheres, as you might guess, made of latex, some sort of polymeric particles. And we wanted to see whether there was a zone where they were excluded. So we dumped in the suspension of microspheres, and what happened is that the microspheres moved progressively away from the interface, and they moved out and out and out. And they finally stopped at a region that was roughly uh, 60 micrometers from the surface. Now, 60 micrometers, by the standards of water molecule size, is practically infinite. So this is a huge region. And we found that these microspheres stayed there. They never invaded the, th this, this particular zone. They underwent their thermal motion that you'd expect, Brownian motion, but they never went in. So we thought, this is really interesting because this zone is so large. And the implication is that maybe the, or, the region of ordering could extend quite far from the nucleating surface. Someone said it must be an artifact. Something about this particular gel must be causing a problem. So we tried another gel. This was a polyacrylic acid gel. And we put the polyacrylic acid gel in. We waited five minutes. And we looked in the microscope. And the result was this. So <clears throat> here's. Here's one edge of the gel, and here's the other edge of the gel. This is just an optical reflection, so please ignore it. And after five minutes, the microspheres had moved to here and out to here, too. 
and leaving a region on the order of 250 micrometers, four times larger than the previous one. And again, it was the same. The microspheres stayed there. They underwent Brownian motion, but they never returned in, into this region. You could actually see this with your naked eye because it's a quarter of a millimeter. You could actually look and, and see. You didn't need a microscope. So we began to see this uh, again and again, and we gave it a name. We called it, for obvious reasons, an exclusion zone, or EZ uh, for short. By now, this has been confirmed by many people. Nothing, nothing new about it. It was actually published in the Journal of Physiology 40 years ago, although we hadn't known about it. Um, so what I want to do now is to get to the basis of, of what, what this is all about. And what I want to do is answer five questions. The first one is, is this phenomenon general, or is it just the two gels that I showed you? Um, does it really arise from the ordering of water? Or is there something else that's involved? Can water ordering explain the many anomalies that we know exist in, in water? And uh, if there's order, then what creates the order? What energy? You need to put energy in to create this. And might these findings apply more broadly? So question one about generality, and what you might ask is, what surfaces give rise to this, and what's excluded from it? So in terms of surfaces, the first thing you might ask is, well, what about hydrophobic versus hydrophilic surfaces? And hydrophobic surfaces, we tried several. We found nothing, none of this uh, exclusion. And hydrophilic surfaces, we found this routinely, which whatever hydrophilic surfaces we looked at, we found it. And there are four classes of examples. And I'll show you one example of each of the four classes. The first is hydrophilic gels. This is a partial list of the gels that we've used. They all show different size exclusions, but they all show it. And there are a few more beyond these. The next one is biological surfaces. And this is muscle. We've been studying muscle forever. Um, and this is an example of muscle. You can see that it's not full exclusion because you can see some microspheres, but there's a much higher concentration beyond. We've also tried the inside of blood vessels. You know, you just take the blood vessel, uh, cut it open, lay it open, and we see the same thing. Uh, we've tried plant roots. We've tried uh, other parts of plants, cellulose uh, from, from trees and such, and we see this uniformly. The third class is monolayers. Now, what are monolayers? These are so-called self-assembled monolayers on gold. So this is gold, and one single layer with a standard method is actually adhered on, onto the gold, and you can see that there's exclusion here. And we did this because we wanted to know whether you needed only a single molecular layer to act as a template for growth of whatever is going, or you need something that has thickness to it. So we found that you just need a single molecular layer. The fourth class is polymers, and we uh, here shows a piece of naphion. And naphion is a polymer produced by the DuPont company, and it's used in fuel cells. So it comes in sheets. So we took a sheet, and we just cut the sheet as a, in an arrowhead. We lay the sheet down on the chamber. We pour in the microspheres in the water, and then you can see what happens after you do that. You can see that the microspheres begin moving away from from the surface of the naphion, and they move and move, and this is stopped prematurely. Actually, it will extend out to something like 400 micrometers, sometimes 500 micrometers. It's very large, and again, it stays that way. It doesn't invade anymore. Um, so in terms of generality, uh, numerous hydrophilic surfaces show this kind of exclusion, but hydrophobic surfaces don't show this uh, at all. So it's quite general. Now, what's excluded? Well, so far, I've just shown you, have shown you no solutes, only particles. And we're going to start with particles and then go down in size to see what actually can be excluded from it. And um, we started with particles. And this is a partial list of all the particles that we've examined that are excluded from, from, from this zone. Now, getting smaller, uh, we decided to look at protein. Protein, typical protein is albumin. We tried albumin laboring labeling it with a fluorescent dye. And it's shown here. So this is a time series going from here to here, time zero. And in the first panel, you see a piece of naphion. It sits in the chamber. And the reason you can see it is because it fluoresces. So you see the fluorescent and nothing here. And then we add the protein here, labeled with a fluorophore so that it's fluorescent. And you can see it. And gradually, uh, you can see that this exclusion zone is increasing in size. So it looks as though 
the protein, which is typically a few nanometers in size, is excluded. Now, what about things that are smaller? So uh, it's not so easy to figure out something to, to use to look at, but dyes are the obvious thing to look at. We tried fluorescein dye, which is molecular weight 376, and it's excluded. But uh, most interesting, we tried pH-sensitive dyes. Now, this is a mixture of dyes, molecular weight about 100 or so, uh, three or four different dyes. And you, you put them as like litmus paper. It changes color depending on the pH. So we took a piece of naphion, we put in the water, containing some of this pH-sensitive dye to see if the dye was excluded. And this is a pretty picture that you can see, although is it possible to turn down the lights a little bit uh, or, or not? If it's not, it's OK, but the pictures will be much better if it's possible. Anyway, thank you. Um, I guess I'm the only one showing color slides. OK, that's fine. OK, so here's, here's the naphion, and the point is that here's the exclusion zone, and you can see, you can't see, if, you, if, the, if the lights were low, you might be able to see that this region is clear. In other words, there's no dye that gets into the exclusion zone region here. You still can't see it, but um, anyway, if you take my word for it, you can see it really clearly on the screen. And the rest of it uh, contains the dye, and the dye has all these pretty pretty colors, pretty pictures, that, the colors that you can see. And what's, what's important uh, for, for later, not for this particular uh, slide, what's important is that these colors correspond to different pHs. And the pH here is pH less than 3. Now, low pH means highly acidic, which means you have a lot of protons. And pH 3 is a lot of protons. And so this is a region that contains a, a, a huge abundance of protons. Okay, we'll get back to that in, in a moment. Um, so in terms of the generality, what I've shown you is that many hydrophilic surfaces generate exclusion zones, and many solutes are excluded. So it's a, uh, a pretty uh, general uh, phenomenon. Now, question two is, is this zone really different from bulk water? Uh, I've, I've, I've alluded to the possibility that it might be different, but I presented no evidence so far. And now I want to present evidence, although rather than that, what I really want to do is list the evidence and discuss only two of the particular experiments. Otherwise, it would take too much time. A lot of the stuff has been published. Some of it is about to be published. And so what's the evidence that this water is really physically different? The first is that we found using NMR, looking for those of you who are familiar with is the so-called T2 value, uh, which showed that the exclusion zone water molecules were more constrained. That is, uh, they're constrained undergoing rotational movement than uh, bulk water molecules. We found also that they're more stable. And we found that by looking at the infrared radiation coming from, from the exclusion zone versus the bulk water. And the exclusion zone radiates less, distinctly less. And I'll show a slide later, meaning that it's more stable or has a, a lower emissivity. We found also that this region has a negative charge. And I'll show you the experiments in a moment that demonstrated that. It's not neutral. We found that it absorbs light at 270 nanometers, that is in the UV, and uh, bulk water doesn't do that. I'll show you that one too. We found it's more viscous than bulk water. We found that the molecules are aligned using uh, polarizing microscopy and uh, birefringence. And we found that the molecular structure is somehow different. We used infrared absorption. And we haven't been able to get spectra yet, but we see that this exclusion zone absorbs differently from, from um, uh, bulk water. And recently, there should be another one there. I haven't listed it, but Nikolai Bunkin from Moscow has measured the refractive index of this zone. It's 10% higher than the refractive index of bulk water, suggesting it's probably more dense than bulk water. So I want to go over a couple of these just uh, because they'll be important. The first is the 270 nanometer absorption. How did we measure that? Well, it's simple. Uh, we used a system that looks like this. There's a slit here and a slit here. The light is passed through the two slits, and it passes through this cuvette. And the cuvette is simply a chamber with a piece, a slab of naphion on one side, and water is poured in here. So there'll be an exclusion zone that develops right here. Now, by moving this uh, cuvette either left or right, we could then probe dis uh, regions far from the exclusion zone, close to the exclusion zone, and inside the exclusion zone to see what the absorption spectrum looked like. We wanted to see whether that spectrum is different from that of bulk water. And we found that it was. And here's the result. So this is 
absorbance versus wavelength. And these numbers are the distance from the interface, the water Nafion interface. So you can see that if you are more than, say, 500 or 600 micrometers from the interface, the curve is flat. Flat means no different from bulk water. As you get into the exclusion zone, closer to the interface, this one would be right in the middle of the exclusion zone, you can see a giant peak at 270 nanometers. So this water absorbs very strongly at 270 nanometers, but bulk water doesn't. The second one I want to talk about, yeah? Could you go back for just a second? Yeah. What is that spike? We don't know. Uh, it's probably some artifact, some reflection artifact. Um, yeah, it's probably a machine artifact. And we found also that it has a negative charge, and the experiment is shown here. So inside means the inside of a gel. This is a polyacrylic acid gel. So here's a gel, and here's the outside. Outside means water. So water, gel. And here's the interface. And we wanted to measure the electrical potential in the region of the, of the interface. And to do that, we took two electrodes. So these are microelectrodes used in biology for many years. They taper down to a m less than one micrometer. And so you put <coughs> one electrode out here somewhere and as a reference electrode. And the second one is a probe electrode. And you move from point to point. So when you're at a distance uh, of 400 or so micrometers from, from the interface, the potential difference between here and here is zero, which is what you expect. However, as you get closer, you begin to pick up a negative potential, which goes down to minus uh, about 120 millivolts. And the region of negativity corresponds to <coughs> roughly to the size of the exclusion zone. So it looks like the exclusion zone is negative. So we tried the experiment again. We took away the gel and re replaced it with a piece of Nafion. Um, and so here's the result with the Nafion. Um, you can see that the negativity begins farther from the interface, and it extends to a lower, a larger negativity than, than the other. And Nafion has a bigger exclusion zone. So it looks like, it looks like uh, the region of the exclusion zone, whether it's smaller or bigger, is negatively charged. Now, you'd say, well, negatively charged doesn't really make sense because if you think about the experiment, you have gel sitting in the water, a gel sitting there, and then you pour in some water. The water is neutral. So how are you going to get negatively char negative charge created from neutrality? How can you take neutral water and give this large negatively charged zone? Well, the only way you can conceivably think of that without inventing charge is to say, well, somehow the water molecule containing negative and positive must split. And therefore, the negative component somehow organizes itself there, but there must be a positive component somewhere else, right? So, so where might that be? Well, you might think it's going to be somewhere out here. And is there any evidence for a positive region? Well, you've already seen the evidence. You've seen this slide, and now it's turned 90 degrees so that it's similar to what I, the format I just showed you. And uh, here is the Nafion. Here is the exclusion zone, which doesn't look as clear as it, it should be. Yeah. And I showed you a, a moment ago that, that this was negatively charged. And remember, from a previous slide, this is loaded with protons, or actually hydronium ions. So you have negative here, positive here. So if you have negative and positive, um, then you do have a positively charged region. And just to check whether this is really so, we put one electrode in here, one electrode here. We connected the two through a resistor. And if so, you ought to get current flow from here to here. And this is shown in the next slide. So here's current as a function of time. And it starts at a high value. It comes down and it reaches some plateau approximately. It's not zero, it's a plateau of current. So it looks as though there really is this charge separation. Uh, it, this confirms the charge separation. And so um, what, what you really have now is something that looks like this. You have some material here, and the surface or interface is actually right here. At this, and this is water. And this region of the water is the exclusion zone, whose physical chemical properties are different from this. That's sitting here. And then you have a region of bulk water here containing a lot of positive charge right here. So you have minus plus, and basically you have a charged battery in water. Now, charged battery in water is something that's weird, something that you, know, you, you really don't think about a whole lot. But there is a, there is a precedent. And the precedent is here. You have water, 
and you have charge separation with enormous potential gradients between what amounts basically to water. And 80% of the lightning flashes are between clouds, not between cloud and ground. So there is some precedent. So I've shown you the two in red. And um, uh, if I had time, I would show you more. Some of it's published. Now, if you look at the ones in blue. Can I, yeah. Can I ask you a sure. question? Sure. Uh, from your, your previous diagram of the, the battery. Yeah. Have you invented yeah, that one? Have we you put two electrodes in there? Yeah. Have you invented the perpetual motion machine? Yeah, it looks like a perpetual motion machine, and I'll get to that in a moment, because obviously it can't be a perpetual motion machine. I'll get to the energy of what creates this charge separation. That's the most interesting question of all. <laughs> OK. Although it would be nice to invent a perpetual motion machine. <laughs> Nobody would believe you. I know. Uh, we wouldn't get it patented. <laughs> OK, and so, so if you look at the blue ones, uh, the uh, molecules are aligned. Um, and they're more stable, and they're more constrained than molecules of bulk water. So what does that amount to? Well, the best descriptor we can think of is a liquid crystal. And so to summarize so far where I've come, um, it looks as though somehow this material is kind of liquid crystalline, the best thing we can, we can call it, just for generic purposes. It has negative charge. It excludes solutes profoundly. I've shown you down to molecular weight 100, but we have some evidence that even salts are excluded. It may be non-dipolar. I alluded to that, and I'll go into that in a, in a moment. And, um, most importantly, it extends very far. So the common view in chemistry is that this ordered water may extend two or three molecular layers. And what I've shown you is two or three million molecular layers, sometimes more. It was suggested 100 years ago by Sir William Hardy, famous physical chemist, that water doesn't really have three phases, but actually four phases and um, an interfacial phase. And there was actually a lot of evidence for this sort of thing before 1950. And it's all been forgotten. Uh, I'm not sure if this constitutes a fourth phase, but it's clearly different from solid or liquid. And there's a lot of it. So perhaps. Now, I alluded to the idea that this structure is not just simply a stack of dipoles. And why do we think so? Actually, I thought so until two or three years ago. And then I some, somehow had a revelation which seems so, so simple that I consider myself stupid for not having thought of it earlier. The first thing is that this region has negative charge, but dipoles are neutral. You see, So you can't have a stack of dipoles which are neutral to give you a negative charge. Doesn't make sense. So something is wrong with, with that idea. The second is that this 270 nanometer absorption, which I showed you, usually it's characteristic of ring-like structures with delocalized electrons. And so that doesn't fit a dipole. Doesn't make sense. So it's another reason why the dipole looks like it might not be correct. Another point is that we found that this zone is amenable to shear thinning. That is, you have a boundary here, and you have this ordered wall water, and you impose flow in this direction. And we found that the faster the flow, the narrower the zone. So it looks like it's eroding uh, as a function of shear. And to think of that occurring, it makes more sense to think of a layered structure where layers would erode one at a time. It's not a necessary condition, but it fits more easily. And finally, the fourth is that any other structure other than a dipole structure would be nice if there was some precedent for the structure rather than just plucking a structure from the air. If you knew of some structure of water that's real, and you start with that, it makes more sense. So that's what, where we started. And the first thing you think about is ice, right? So the structure of ice is well known. If you look, to, uh, well, these are just two different angled views of, of the ice. And these are oxygen atoms. And they form these hexagons. You see a honeycomb structure. And they're stacked upon one another. And uh, the hydrogens lie halfway between the oxygen. So there's one here, one here. They're just omitted for simplicity. right? Now, if you look at a dip from a different angle, it, you, it kind of loses the flavor of hexagonality. But you can see that the oxygens, the negative oxygens, are connected by a positive proton. That glues the planes together and gives you ice, which is hard, solid, because of this glue. So if we start with this idea and ask the question, well, is it possible that we can think of an ice-like structure that maybe, maybe suffices? And of course, this, the ice doesn't work, the ice itself, because ice is solid. And the region we're looking at is more sort of gel-like, liquid crystalline, not, not solid. However, one idea 
that you might think of is, well, suppose we remove these protons from in between, you see? So you remove the protons, and then the glue that holds these layers together is missing, so now you don't have a solid anymore. You have something that's uh, less. The problem with this wonderful idea is that it doesn't work. It doesn't work because this structure will fly apart because what you have are you have oxygens next to oxygens and two negatively charged, they just, the structure will fly apart. So, so you know, ugly fact uh, getting in the way of a beautiful idea. So, so that fails. However, another idea came. What if you were to shift uh, one of these planes in some direction relative to the one below it? And so here, here's what happens. So I've shown two planes. Now you can see the hydrogens between the oxygens here. So you have a lighter plane behind and the brighter one closer to you. And if you shift it by half the distance between two oxygens, then what you have is, for example, this negative oxygen from behind lines up with the positive hydrogen closer to you, and then you have electrostatic sticking, plus and minus. And you see that here, 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 here. So I guess one, one third of them are stuck together. So you can have a structure that actually sticks together, and it sticks loosely. It doesn't stick rigidly like ice, which is what you want. And also, remember, we've removed protons from something that's neutral. And if you remove positive from neutral, you get negative, and we want negative. So this looks more promising. Uh, it turns out if you, if, you, uh, if you add up the charges in here, you get minus one. So that's very nice. It's not zero, it's minus one. So the idea then is that you start with the nucleator, and you start from the nucleator, and you build up these honeycomb planes one by one, as, as I've, I've shown you, and it just keeps <coughs> basically keeps building. Now, I've shown you that in order to do this, I've taken the upper plane and moved it a little bit at zero degrees, let's say, relative to the one behind. But I didn't have to move it at zero degrees. I could have moved it at uh, 60 degrees or 120 degrees, et cetera, and would have gotten exactly the same result, or similar re result. It, it works. So, so you have six different options for shifting one plane relative to the next. And that's nice because it gives you a lot of flexibility. So if you look, for example, at layer one here, now layer two, or layer zero, layer one has been shifted zero degrees, layer two, 60 degrees, 120 degrees, et cetera, and what you find is a helix. So why is a helix interesting? Helix is interesting because, because uh, biological molecules are mostly helical. So DNA, RNA, proteins all have helical shape. And it's known that these molecules have to interface with water in some kind of ordered water. And this gives a very nice possibility for doing it. So the advantages of the non-dipolar exclusion zone is it has precedent, first of all, that is ice. It has negative charge, which is what we need. The ring-like structures are amenable to uh, the 270 nanometer absorption that, that's seen, uh, unlike the dipoles. It's able to accommodate helical structures. Question. What's the repeat length or the pitch of this helical structure? The pitch would be, uh, the smallest pitch you could get would be six, uh, that would be about two nanometers, but you, you could get 20 angstroms, but you could get uh, larger ones or irregular ones as well. Right. So for, I think for DNA, you need a pitch of 34 angstroms or 3.4 nanometers. Well, OK, yeah. So it, it might not fit exactly, but some layers might be able to interface with some. Uh, not yet worked out. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there a chirality issue that these spiral structures go north 60 and 20 or minus 60 minus 20? And that could relate to DNA. It, it certainly might. Uh, it's not clear about the chirality. Uh, of course, there is chirality in nature, and uh, the amino acids especially are, are chiral. And this could actually uh, it could be amenable with the, any of the two chiralities. And so that's not been investigated. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting point, yeah. It's amenable to shear thinning because it's a layered structure. And, and another point that I think is important is that the idea of Brownian instability. Now, if you remember, I brought up the point that the conventional view is if you start stacking dipoles and each dipole starts 
moving with thermal motion, by the time you get to the fifth or tenth, the thermal motion should be so large that the structure would, would break, dissipate, be unstable. So here is a, an analogy of the dipoles, and you start stacking dipoles. Uh, uh, and by the time you get to a fairly large stack, the, the shaking and instability is so great that the whole thing may collapse, although some view it as otherwise. But if you have a, a structure such as the one that's being suggested, where instead of having isolated uh, dipoles, where you have interconnected uh, links that are practically infinite, the mass is large enough that the thermal motion is greatly reduced, and these planes are stuck together as well. So, there should be no realistic uh, limitation of thermal motion to the growth of this. It's not the kind of objection that ought to come as a result of this. And uh, so the large sheets uh, eliminate or greatly reduce that problem. So it looks good, except for one problem, and that is polywater. How many of you have ever heard of polywater? Oh, two or three. OK, so, so polywater was a big scandal, a debacle that took place. And I'll just summarize in, in two minutes. So uh, it started with this guy, Boris Deryagin, who at the time was the premier physical chemist in all of Russia. And he found uh, that if you take water and put it into very narrow capillary tubes, that this water would take on different properties. It, it would become very stable, difficult to freeze, difficult to vaporize, higher density, 1.3, 1.4 compared to usual water. And at first, this, this, this uh, caused a lot of excitement. After some time, some people in the West, this was the East, in Russia, some people in the West began to, to, be, uh, uh, to be doubtful about it. And several people found artifact. Okay, and the artifact, there were two kinds of artifact. The first was the idea that this water was not really pure water, as the Russians had claimed. It actually leached silica from the walls of the capillary tube. In other words, the capillary tube could be dissolved in the water. So that was the first problem. The second problem was some Australians um, uh, found that if they put salt in the water and measured the Raman spectra, uh, that the spe spectra that they got was very similar to the spectra that the Russians got. And so they said, well, the Russians must have been sweating in their water. <laughs> and that sealed the coffin of, of, of this uh, really interesting finding. So um, just before that happened, a few months before, there was a paper by Lippincott et al. in Science, a lead article in Science, and they coined the name Polywater for this stuff because it looked like a polymer. It was very stable. And they suggested this structure as being the only structure that was consistent with that. That's the same structure as we came to. We came to it by a different line of reasoning than they came to. So I'm not sure whether you would consider that to be an advantage or a disadvantage um, that they came up much earlier with a similar structure. In fact, the idea of contamination in water, what they were using is water that sort of natural water, because no water can be pure, because water is such a, a wonderful solvent for practically everything that it's impossible to get absolutely pure water. So the experiments were never criticized, only the purity of the water that was used for the experiments. So it might be that this is actually um, OK. I don't know. Anyway, the answer to question two, is it physically distinct from bulk water? Yes, it's physically distinct. It's liquid crystalline and possibly a layered honeycomb structure, just like graphene, which got last year's Nobel Prize. OK, now, can crystalline water explain various counterintuitive uh, anomalies that are associated with water? So what do we expect from a crystal, from a liquid crystal or any kind of crystal? Well, the first thing is that a crystal stick together, like a salt crystal or whatever kind of crystal. And so if you think about your dessert, a jello, some of your dessert, it's 95% water. And the question is, how come the water doesn't dribble out like a shower out of it? And there are various osmotic arguments to, that could maintain the, the water inside. However, some gels are 99.95% water. I mean, essentially all water, the few little strands of polymer. And those arguments don't really work very well. But another idea uh, as to why they don't dribble out is if you actually think about a gel and what a gel looks like. So it's some kind of matrix containing polymer or protein with great big spaces in between. Now, what happens in these spaces? Well, these are actually hydrophilic surfaces. And we saw what happens with hydrophilic surfaces. They nucleate growth of the exclusion zone. So these regions are 
actually not filled with bulk water. They're filled with the liquid crystal. They're filled with EZ water. And if it's filled with EZ water, then we can understand why it, why, why it would stay there, why it wouldn't necessarily leak out. And the other point is that this water should be gel-like. And so when you eat your dessert and you ask the question, why does a gel feel like a gel? You can ask yourself, and the experts in the field will say, well, it behaves like a gel because the matrix, the polymer or protein matrix, has viscoelastic properties that make it gel-like. But a possibility is that the reason it's gel-like is because the water inside acts like a gel, especially in cases where 99.95% .95 of the stuff is water. Crystals can be very stiff, as you know, if you have a diamond ring or Whatever. Now, this is an experiment done by a colleague, Elmar Fuchs. And this is remarkable. There are two beakers of water separated from each other, connected by water. There's just water that you see there. And uh, obviously, there needs to be some kind of uh, stiffness uh, of this um, uh, to hold it. Otherwise, uh, you know, it, it, would, it would collapse. Uh, this droop is very small. The experiment itself looks like this. Um, you take two beakers touching each other, put one electrode here, one electrode here, put 10 kilovolts or so between the two, turn it on, and here's what happens. So the water bridges the gap, and then you pull one beaker apart from the other one, and you can see what happens. This is just water. Water. So water is creating this so-called water bridge, and it has almost no droop. Now, ordinary water doesn't do this. Uh, however, if it's crystalline or liquid crystalline, then you can imagine under certain circumstances the crystal might be a fairly stiff crystal. I think that could be the explanation for what we're seeing here. Uh, another question is, what about floating coins and other things on water? So this is an old Hungarian coin. And you can substitute a paper clip. And if you put it gently on the water, it'll float on the surface of the water. However, if you put it underneath the surface, it sinks right to the bottom. The question is why? And some of you may, may know, well, of course, water is known to have a very high surface tension, so that's the explanation. However, the reason for the surface tension is generally thought to be that you have a single molecular layer on the top, and because the bonds can't bond with the air, they, the bonds with, with other water molecules, you have extra bonds between water molecules that confer kind of additional stiffness. The question is whether those few extra bonds in one molecular layer are sufficient to do this. So we began thinking about it, and we found actually that this kind of crystalline water actually grows at the air-water interface. And the experiment is shown here. So it's basically you take uh, two, two sheets of, of glass parallel, seal them at the edges to form a chamber, and fill that with water and microspheres. So you can see that. Um, it's kind of cloudy. That's because the microspheres scatter light. So here's air. Here is the meniscus. Okay, And there's a region that forms here. It takes 15 to 30 minutes. It's a clear zone, which means that, that these microspheres are excluded from this region. Later, they actually um, sediment to the bottom, but that's uh, roughly in 24 hours. This occurs in 10 or 15 minutes and remains stable. So it's a clear zone, suggesting that it's similar to the EZ, which means it has a much different structure from water. We stuck microelectrodes in it, and we found that, especially near the top surface, we found negative potential, just like an exclusion zone. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you that this region this black region here behaves like a stiff rubber band, a kind of cohesive band that runs along, along the top, along the surface, a uh, thick gel-like band. And, and that's shown here. This is the same as I just showed you. Here are the microspheres in the water. Here's the clear zone. And what we're going to do, we're going to take a probe and touch the surface and impart some kind of mechanical perturbation. And you'll see that the distance from here to here, the thickness, despite the mechanical perturbation, hardly changes at all. So see, so you're coming up now and then moving from side to side. And you can see that the thickness remains uh, constant. So this is not just ordinary water on top. This is a kind of a thick, cohesive band. And so if you think about why the coin floats on the water, I would like to suggest to you that the high surface tension, uh, I'll get to you, OK, is, is not necessarily just a, a result of a single molecular layer, but a thick layer that may have the kind of gel-like properties of an exclusion zone. Please. Yeah. So could you 
comment on the shape of the microsphere profile? Yeah. Yeah, we often find uh, here, you mean this and this? Yeah, we often find that. And the suggestion uh, of this is that, you know, this is where the capillary action occurs. And the suggestion is that the capillary action has something to do with exclusion zone. And we think that it has everything to do with exclusion zone and separation of charge. I can talk after when we get to the question if you want more on that. Good, good point. Okay, and so, uh, yeah. Okay, so now, yeah, in terms of staying on top of the water. So maybe some of you have seen this before. This is a Central American lizard. You, you know about this one. Maybe you know more about it than I do. <laughs> yeah, from Brazil, maybe, also? OK. So, <laughs> okay, so this, this uh, lizard um, walks on the water. And so it's known as the Jesus Christ lizard because it walks on the water. And the question is, you know, is this really possible from a single molecular layer, or is there something thick beneath the surface that's keeping it up and doing this? So, question. <laughs> Another point is that um, water on water. So what you see here is a droplet of water suspended from a little pipette. It's about to drop on the surface of water. And here's the surface. It's been standing for some time. So from what I've just shown you, you know that the surface of the water here has a kind of thick, easy-like uh, layer. And the same thing occurs here because this thing is exposed to the air. This is water and this is air, same as here. So it could also have a thick, easy-like layer. Now when you drop water on water, of course, most of you think that it dissolves instantly. And sometimes it does. However, if you do the experiment uh, the, the right way, it doesn't dissolve instantly. It does this. It's a kind of uh, dance, and it's perfectly repeatable. It occurs in five or six steps, and it's deterministic. Uh, so something interesting is going on, and I would suggest to you it's because the EZ is meeting the EZ. And uh, you can actually see this sometimes outside yourself. So this is taken outside our laboratory. It's a bicycle locker, and it's raining out, as it does often in Seattle. So there's a lot of water here, and the raindrops are falling. And you can see these spots here, uh, shown here. See, they don't instantly coalesce. So if you look outside, you can see this actually quite often. And the reason I, 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 I reiterate is that these droplets contain an easy shell, because the air-water interface gives rise to this sort of thing. And that keeps it from instantly dissolving. So another point now is what keeps the charges separated from one another? So you know, uh, being, being physicists, that obviously if you have negative charge here and positive charge, the first thing that will happen is they'll just annihilate one another. But they don't. And they don't because you can measure the potential difference over long periods of time. So it's sustained. So how is it possible that these positive charges are kept out of this negative zone? And when you think about it, the, re the reason, I think, is because this zone, there are not free charges here. The charges are embedded in a matrix. And this matrix is so tight that the hydronium ions, which are basically positively charged water, simply can't penetrate into here. So these are actually kept apart from one another. So basically, the battery charges remain separated from one another. So the answer to question three is yes. I think that liquid crystalline water can explain many uh, of the anomalies that you see with water. It explains why the water battery charges remain separated. That's an important one. OK, so do we have a perpetual motion machine here? Or is there something that actually charges this uh, water battery? We found it's the sun, free energy, so to speak, uh, literally. Uh, and we found this out first by looking, so uh, pardon the green, we just use green light with the microscope. So here's Nafion, here's the exclusion zone, here are the microspheres. And one day someone came with a lamp, one of these gooseneck laboratory lamps, and shined the light and <laughs> voila, this thing grew like crazy. And so we thought, well, we should start doing some, maybe some real experiments on this. And the first experiment was, so here's Nafion, here's the exclusion zone and the microspheres, and we illuminated using an LED light emitting diode, very weak, for five minutes. And we found that this increased by two and a half to three times through that exposure. So it really looked as though light, or so to speak, light, electromagnetic energy, the photons were responsible for the energy to, to, to build this. And someone said, well, you made a mistake because you're using infrared illumination. 
and one micrometer, I th think this was a 0 0.8, I forget, I forget which, and maybe it's heating the chamber. And so we checked putting thermometers at uh, uh, a thermometer at various positions in here at the end of the five minutes, and we never saw a temperature rise more than one degree. These are very, very weak sources. So obviously, you want to get spectral information. And so here's the exclusion zone size ratio, that is how much expansion you get relative to the control as a function of wavelength. So here's the UV region, the visible region, and the infrared region. And the result shows, so for example, if you take green light and shine it for, for five minutes, at the end of five minutes, you get a 60% expansion, et cetera. So it depends on wavelength, and you can see that that the most important wavelength is in the infrared, not the visible, in the infrared at 3,000 nanometers or 3 micrometers. It's well known that 3 micrometers is the wavelength that's absorbed most by the water. So it looks like the wavelength that's most absorbed by the water is the one that expands the exclusion zone the most, which is satisfying. Now, I didn't mention to you a technical issue. At our disposal, to you make these measurements was very low intensity uh, radiant energy. So it was weak compared to, the, to, to this range. It was 600 times weaker. So if we were able to get LEDs with the same intensity, obviously this curve would be much higher. It would be way up, up there. And so probably the real result, if we could have used properly, used the same intensities throughout instead of higher ones and lower ones, is a continuous curve of some sort peaking at three micrometers. Now what that means is that if we're sitting in this room and we, we make the measurement under the microscope and we turn off the lights, it makes almost no difference, just a little bit of difference because the infrared is most important. So where does the infrared come from? It comes from all over. If you turn off the lights, turn on an infrared camera, you get a beautiful image of every one of you and the walls and the posters and the table and everything. It's all emitting infrared because the sun's energy hits the walls and the walls re-radiate and give off infrared energy. So it's free. It comes from the sun and it's used to build these exclusion zones. So it's not a perpetual motion machine. So it's incident radiant energy that builds the exclusion zone and separates the charge. So the answer to question four about the energy is it's powered by photons. And these photons order the water and, and separate the charge in the water battery. So if you think of the energy flow outside, um, so this is the conventional view that you got the sun, the sun hits the water, and it generates enough heat that you can go swimming in the summertime, the water heats up. What I've shown you is a separate, distinct pathway. And that pathway is that the sun hits the water and it imparts uh, basically potential energy. It imparts energy for building order and separating charge. Okay, so whether this is more important than this is not clear, or whether indeed it's possible that you have to go through this one to get to this one, that's also a possibility that we're beginning to think about. So the question is, if you're giving this energy to the water all the time, and the water is, is absorbing this kind of energy, if it keeps absorbing, it'll explode, right? It's got to do something with this energy. And the question is, is it possible that you can actually harvest this energy? Can you take energy from a glass of water? And you'll say, it's impossible. But I show you an experiment that demonstrates otherwise. So this is an experiment that a young undergraduate did and came running into my lab, into my office, to tell me it's, it's serendipity. So he took a chamber. With, with water in it and some microspheres in the water so that we could see what's going on, and a tube. This is a tube made of naphion, which gives very large exclusion zones uh, sitting here. And later, we did it with a polyacrylic acid gel tube, so it's not, it's not distinct for naphion. It's more general. And what we noticed in, in this tube is we noticed incessant flow through the tube. Now, again, this sort of looks like a perpetual motion machine, but um, let, me, let me explain. So, so we put the tube there, and the flow starts. Some day it will go this way, another day it goes this way. We couldn't tell, but once it gets started, it just keeps going. And so here's an example, the Nafion tube. Here's Nafion. Here's the exclusion zone just inside the tube, and you can see it going. And the next slide shows you more or less the same thing with a polyacrylic acid gel with a tunnel cut through. Here's the gel. Here's the tunnel, exclusion zone here, and you can see the flow going through. So there's no pressure gradient here that's driving it. This is so-called spontaneous flow. 
And we have a few preliminary experiments now showing that you can even do it with the water higher here than here, although these experiments have stopped for a while, so not much progress until next month. Anyway, uh, it's still driving against a hydrostatic gradient, but even if there were no hydrostatic gradient, you're still pushing against viscosity, so it requires energy. So I think this is evidence that some kind of energy must be in, in the system, otherwise we're back to the perpetual motion machine, which this isn't. And the suggestion I've given to you is that energy is being absorbed from the environment, particularly infrared uh, energy. So it, infrared energy can be harvested to do work. So again, you know, this seems unusual. You never really think about water doing work, right? However, if you think about it, um, what I'm suggesting to you is this water is absorbing energy and doing work as a result. When you think about the plant and what it does, it actually does the same thing. It absorbs photonic energy, and that energy is converted into work, growth, flows, metabolism, you name it. The energy comes from the sun, and I'm suggesting to you that the same thing is true here, that the, sun, the sun's energy is continuously absorbed by this water. Right? And the water is not at equilibrium. The water keeps absorbing energy, and that energy can be used to do work. If you accept that, then you have to think about Brownian motion. In the case of Brownian motion, the currently accepted view is that the fluid, the water containing the particles, is at equilibrium with the environment. I've shown it's not at equilibrium. I've shown you that it keeps absorbing energy from the environment. Now, if it keeps absorbing energy, you have to ask the question whether those little motions that you see are the result of very simple transduction, whether the energy that's coming from outside is used to drive those little motions. And, of course, if you happen to have a director like a tube, those motions will be coordinated and you can get useful work. This is not useful work. This is random motions, but it is work. So, and that's where we get to the title E equals H2O because I think the, the units don't match, um, but, but the idea is that whenever you have water, you have energy. The two are, are hand in hand. Okay, so last question. Why is all of this stuff important? Uh, I think it could be foundational for various sciences um, involving water and, and light. Okay, and so, so here's sort of some, what's summarizing what I've, been, what I've been telling you, that you have a charged particle or molecule, and around it you have this liquid crystalline water, negatively charged, and positively charged hydronium ions that, that surround it. And all of this is susceptible to energy from outside. That's what I've shown you. If it's true, then it's different from what you hear in the, in, in, in the read in the chemistry book because, because the chemistry book says all you've got is the particle or molecule and a couple of inert layers of water sitting around it, and that's all. So this is, this is qualitatively different from the current view. It's also true inside cells in our body, and this book I wrote 10 years ago, and it's heretical. It suggests that unlike the current cell biology books that you really can't understand the function of the cell unless you understand the water and how the water interacts inside the cell. It's central to everything that happens inside the cell. So all of your cells are filled with easy water. That's why they're negatively charged. Now, okay, so you ask the question, um, what happens if you have more than one particle? Suppose you have two particles of the same charge. Now, you're a group of physicists, so uh, a mathematician, so you probably know the right answer. But so you take two of these and you put them next to each other, close to one another, and they both have negative charge. So I would ask you, they both have the same charge. What happens to the distance between them? Anybody? Okay, everybody agree? Yeah. Okay, well, the answer is they come toward one another. Thank you. <laughs> And this is, this is not our bizarre observation, although we actually published a few experiments on this. This was known first by Irving Langmuir, for whom a uh, physical chemistry journal is named many years ago. And the person who really, I think, got it right was none other, th other than Richard Feynman, who in his, uh, no, don't agree? I'm just trying to wait one more thing to Feynman. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. okay, well, he said, you know, these are like charges, and he, he called it, he said, like, likes, like. I think that was in his Nobel lecture. He said, two like-charged 
entities like each other. Therefore, you know, if you like each other, you come, come together. And he said, like likes like because of an intermediate of unlike. So you have unlike charges here. And these unlike charges then create an attractive force that draw this negative and this negative this way. And they keep going. And so wh when do they stop? Well, they've got to stop because this negative repels this negative. And so when there's a balance, the attractive force equals the repulsive force, then you get stability. It's not equilibrium. It's uh, stability. And of course, if you have a lot of these, then you can imagine that the result will look something like this. And that's called a colloid crystal. And this is very well known among physical chemists. They don't necessarily touch each other. They're separated, and they remain that way. And your yogurt might be very similar to, to this. So now if you go to the question, why does the water vapor coalesce into the discrete units? Basically, you know, you have aerosol droplets. The cloud contains many droplets, and they all have the same, presumably, the same, same charge. And so you'd expect them to disperse. But the like, likes, like mechanism brings them together instead of dispersing. And the energy for that is from the sun. And there's plenty of sunlight driving it. So <coughs> I think that's the possible explanation for why you see clouds like this. Now, a special example of like, likes, like is the origin of life. I'm not sure what your beliefs are on the, on the subject, but, uh, you know, <laughs> but, you know, step one in, in the origin of life, uh, some people would think that, okay, in the primitive Earth, you, you've got water and you've got some molecules. You don't know which molecules, but molecules that are spread out. But you can't get anything unless they come together to form a condensed mass. So why would they want to come together to form a condensed mass? Well, um, the, the dispersed molecules coalesce. If you follow the line of argument, it, it comes naturally. So you have water, and you have the molecules or particles add sunlight to that. And it drives the uh, like, likes, like mechanism. So they come together. And this aggregate keeps growing, just like the cell, a kind of self-assembly, a very simple self-assembly that doesn't involve complicated chaperone molecules. That's very popular in biology or whatever. Very simple. It has negative charge, just like the cell. It has potential energy, just like the cell. And it has the capacity to divide. If you simply change the local pH here, the, the two will, will come apart. And so it's possible that step one in the origin of life might be a light-induced aggregation coming together. And all that's needed, as I said, is the sun's energy and molecules and water to do it. Now, if that's true, if it's as simple as that, then you need to ask the question, um, was it a one-time event that took place when everything was, the stars came together 2.7 billion years ago? Or is it something that's occurring, the first step is occurring all the time out there? Something to think about. Okay, another example uh, is, that has just sort of come to light, highly speculative, is energy from food. Uh, we just had lunch. Uh, okay, and um, you know what lunch often it looks like, and we have the hamburgers and the onions and tomatoes, or whatever. And so, the question is, where does the energy come from? And uh, we all know the answer from that, right? It comes comes from the protein in the in the hamburger. It gives us gives us energy. And certainly, the hamburger makes us fat. If we have too many hamburgers, the proteins from the hamburger adds to our girth and our mass, and we become fatter. No question about that. Question. Uh, well, I think there's a lot in the lettuce. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll come to that uh, in, in a moment. I think y y you'll see if you, if you get my, my flow and gist that there might actually be something in the lettuce, not to make you fat, but oh, OK. So, so the food's energy. Now, if you look inside the hamburger, um, what's inside the hamburger? Well, you've got, let's say, let's say it's pure protein. OK, so you have protein here and protein here. It could be fat, but it doesn't matter. Around each protein is an exclusion zone, negatively charged. And around that are these protons that are sitting, or hydronium ions sitting here. So there's no doubt that these guys uh, add mass to our bodies. But the separate question is, where does the energy come from? Is it really from the burning of the protein, or is it something else? Now, if you think about it, when you eat the hamburger, you have negative charge here and positive charge here. That's potential energy. And you know that potential energy doesn't just vanish. It goes somewhere. So you're swallowing, every time you bite into a hamburger, you're swallowing potential energy. And the question is, how much of this potential energy really gets radiated away? And how much of the potential energy gives us energy? And I think the question is not answered. It's not clear what fraction of our energy, as opposed to our girth, comes from 
the separation of charge in, in water. We don't know that. The same thing with the apple and the same thing with the lettuce and even a glass of water because glass of water can also contain pockets of EZ material with separation of charge. There's good evidence for this. I don't have time to go into it. Okay. Another implication is electromagnetic signals coming, um, containing information. And this is wildly speculative. Okay. So if you have a, a nucleating surface and you have this sort of, you don't have any information here because the structure is regular. So any radiant energy coming from that doesn't really tell you very much. Uh, however, we're talking about, um, uh, when you talk about the nucleating surface, a generic one might look like this with a very uniform charge distribution throughout. But that's generic, and that's the kind of, su of, of surface that would give you this regular array. But no surface is generic. Real surfaces contain unique distributions of charge. So, for example, here's one that's missing a few negatives. So it's going to create exclusion zones that reflect this, uh, th this particular structure. And so you might expect, for example, in one of these layers that you're missing an oxygen here and missing an oxygen here. And this would be characteristic of that particularly unique structure that gave rise to this, uh, this exclusion zone material. And this should, uh, this should, these defects, you might say, should project over many layers. And that contains information. And so if you have exclusion zones sitting in water, and we have evidence that you can actually separate the exclusion zones from the nucleating surface, then they will contain information depending on what was respons the nucleating surface that was responsible. So there's information that's contained in here. And if there's information that's contained in here that has long-term persistence, then you have to ask the question, well, you have energy coming into the water, right? And the water may contain some information-bearing, easy structures, certain vibratory modes that are unique to that particular nucleating surface. And therefore, you have information out. And that information, that information that's getting radiated out has some bearing on what was the nucleating surface. There are experiments now, uh, I don't want to take the time to tell you, but just roughly, where you can actually take DNA in water and put water next to it. And from that water, you can create DNA that has the same sequence as the original through electromagnetic radiation. These experiments are from Luc Montagnier, who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago. He's coming to our water meeting, in case any of you are interested in the subject, in October. OK, so it has the capacity for memory and for electromagnetic transmission of information. OK, finally, I'd like to end with uh, seven or eight minutes on non-liquid states. We talked about liquid water. We've talked about the fourth phase of water. I'd like to talk about the solid state, which is ice, and the vapor state, which is vapor. OK. So let's talk about the solid state first. Now, remember, the proposed EZ structure is very similar to the I structure. If so, you might think that this EZ structure could be a precursor for the formation of ice. In other words, you have to go through this structure in order to get to ice. And when you melt ice, you should get this structure. In fact, when you melt ice, we found that you always find a 270 nanometer absorption in the melted water. It's transient, but you find it every time. And so there is some suggestion that the two are very closely linked to, to uh, one another. So the idea is that if you start with this structure and you want to create ice, you start with an easy structure, you add protein to it, and then you get ice, because there's no difference between this and this except adding protons to it. That's how we derive this structure. And so the idea, where do you find those protons? Uh, well, you have an exclusion zone here. You have charge here, plenty of protons here. If these protons simply enter this region, then you should get ice. We tried to, uh, one experiment to do, actually we have several experiments now. This is one that tested this idea. So this is a chamber with microspheres in water. And here's a, a copper surface, which can be cooled from outside with a thermoelectric device. Uh, and so we start at room temperature, and we gradually cool this region. As you cool this region, we found to our surprise that when you get to about 14 or 15 degrees, you begin to get an exclusion zone. And this exclusion zone gets bigger and bigger. And finally, this is the region that turns to ice. So it looks like the exclusion zone 
is an intermediate, an intermediate structure between water and ice. You have to go through the exclusion zone in order to, find, to, to get to ice. So the possible freezing process is that the water cools, the exclusion zone builds, charge separates, the proton concentration beyond the exclusion zone builds to a threshold, and then the protons rush into this negative exclusion zone and that becomes ice. So that's a suggestion about how ice might form, which solves some of the thermodynamic uh, issues that have been, always been associated with the formation of ice. Okay, so EZ plus protons give you ice. Now, finally, finally, the vapor state. The vapor state is interesting. Um, if you look at a cup of hot water or tea, this is what you see. Now, most, most of us don't think about it a whole lot, but, but this consists, this vapor consists of little droplets. In order to be able to see the vapor, right, we, you, the droplets have to be at least a certain size, otherwise they won't scatter. If you have one molecule, it doesn't scatter enough to see, but if you have a lot of molecules stuck together, roughly the size of the wavelength of light, then it will scatter and then you can see it. So um, the, the, the fact that you can see it must mean that what's coming up is very large clusters of water somehow, otherwise you wouldn't see it, which to start with is different from, from the current view. Now you'll see a few features. The first is that you see clouds here. And if you actually look at the surface, you'll see one cloud coming, then another one, then another one. It comes in succession. It's a success succession of clouds that rise right from the surface, one after another. And they may appear in one region, but nothing appears in this region. It's a discrete kind of process. If you look here, you can also see that sometimes it comes in these narrow strings that remain distinct from neighboring strings for a long time, like spaghetti strands drawn out of the water. So this is nothing like what we all think about evaporation. Uh, if you also look, you can see sometimes there are little holes here giving you the impression that these are ring-like structures. So we decided to look at this vapor, and we looked at it by... Yeah. Do you get this in vacuum, too? We didn't try this in the vacuum. Uh, vacuum is awkward for evaporation because oh, it's yeah, going to, it yeah. Kind of low, low we, we haven't tried that. Okay. So we took, we took this and we scanned a laser beam right across the surface, just above the surface, as low as we can without touching the surface to see what's actually coming up. And what we found, oh my goodness, you can't see anything. <laughs> uh, well, I'll show you. Maybe you can see here. I'm not sure if you can see here. See, there are kind of rings that you see. I'm not sure if you can see them. They look like donuts that are rising. Um, uh, circles that, that are coming up, just like uh, donuts. And so this was a shock to us. When I saw this for the first time, one of the students came and showed me. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Uh, uh, donuts rising from, from the water. And this is the default structure. This is what you see most of the time. And these donuts actually are continuous. If you take successive frames, you can see the same donut. So it's kind of like a cylinder that's coming up. So we thought, this is really weird. There must be something in the water that's giving rise to the same kinds of structures. What is that? Is there a corresponding structure in water that creates these? Well, if you look at the water, you see this. And this is, this is a structure that's seen with an infrared camera, one that we have in the lab. You take warm water, and you just look with the infrared camera, and what you see is a mosaic structure. So here are the dark regions, and here are the light regions. Now this is an infrared camera, therefore the standard interpretation is they must be cells and this must be warm water and this must be cool water. And that's the reason why you see it. Uh, that's a possibility, but I began to wonder whether that's really so because these are so distinct and so clear. And the question is, could these lines really be possibly be real structures that exist in the fluid, not merely a minor temperature difference giving rise to, to this. And if you look at the exclusion zone, <coughs> here's a piece of naphion, here's the exclusion zone, here's water. And what we found it, when we looked at it, this is published, is that the exclusion zone region generates less infrared than the bulk water. It looks darker. This is a darker uh, region. And so if you think now, that the EZ is dark when you look in infrared, it's dark. So what about this? This is dark. Is it possible that this contains EZ material and this contains bulk water material? That's a question that we raise. Now, if it's a material structure, 
containing EZ, something distinctly different from bulk water, you should be able to detect it with your eyes. It's not just a thermal camera that, that should detect it. Temperature gradients would be difficult to detect with your eye, but real structures are. And so um, we found, uh, I'm not sure if you can see it because of the lighting. Oh, maybe you can. You can see this is just warm water. My son, the artist, took this picture. And you very clearly can see this kind of a, a structure in warm water with a normal camera, nothing infrared. You see? And if you um, look at it, if you do the experiment just right with, with, with a visible light at a very shallow angle, you can see the structures distinctly. And so, so this, is, this looks like um, something real, not just a very minor temperature difference between the inside and the outside. It's, it looks like real material structure. But first, isn't, isn't that uh, a suspension of a movement particle? No, this is just water. The, the one you showed me? Yeah, absolutely. No, no particles. We just start with water. But actually, you can see the same thing in miso soup. That's what I was going to say. I mean, the convection cells are real. And They're absolutely real. Index changes the temperature in the downwelling sheets. Yeah, the, to cause that, to the refractive index differences for three or four degrees is trivially small. It's like a Schlieren photograph. Yeah, like a Schlieren photograph, but the differences in refractive index are really small. There are certainly gradients, uh, flow gradients, uh, vertical gradients, and the question is whether they're really caused by, by uh, temperature differences or mm -hmm. something else. But this is visible light. Right? And so you can see it in visible light. It means that there must be uh, substantial differences of refractive index between the two large ones. Otherwise, you wouldn't see an image that's as clear as you see here. Uh, the, the, I forget the number, but the refractive index difference is on the order of like 0.01 percent between uh, water that's at one temperature and water that's three degrees higher. It's trivially small. The optics people I've spoken to said you would never be able to detect a clear image with, a, with, with something as a difference as small as that. I'm not sure if they're right, but it's very small. So I know that's the prevailing argument, but, but we've actually tried other examples, putting, mixing milk with almond milk. One of my Chinese postdocs did that. And he can see these cells, the distinct separation, but no flow. So the flow is not a necessary condition. It usually occurs, but it doesn't always occur. The up-down flow. Sorry? I'm not a, an optics expert at all, but I would have thought that the geometry that would be most sensitive to refractive index changes would be precisely at grazing incidence, where a one degree angle would correspond to either getting into the water or not. So nearly it, uh, critical internal reflection. I can't answer that. It might be. Yeah, it might be so. Uh, you know, the interpretation is speculative. I'm not sure of it, but I, I think that if we, if we hadn't known about uh, Bernard cells and, and the explanation that relies on temperature gradients, if you had just seen these with visible light, you'd never come up with, with the idea that these are due to thermal gradients. We actually checked it. We put infrared on top to make the heating, the, the region on top hotter than the region on bottom. And you still got these gradients. So the, the usual idea is that, well, you have, the heating is coming from the bottom. It's heating up the water on the bottom, and the water rises because, because it's less dense at the bottom, and so on, giving you these cells. But we heated it from the top, and we still got them. So this is the kind of evidence that suggests that, that although there are certainly convective cells, they're not necessarily caused by thermal gradients. And we looked at this picture where this was just at the beginning of formation of these. And I think you can see little dots that, uh, that comprise, at least if the resolution were better, you can see these forming as little dots. So we think that these are forming as little droplets or bubbles which contain easy shells which stick together by the like-likes-like mechanism, giving you these extended structures. Droplets or bubbles is what, what you can see there. And since these are presumably surrounded by EZ, they're going to have give rise to refractive indices that are much different from the refractive index of ordinary water. Now, obviously, this is preliminary. This is what 
we're beginning to think, or at least I'm beginning to think, is it what's, what goes on. And so it's possible that these mosaics occur not because of a minor temperature difference, uh, but actually because it consists of a different structure. And I think the most likely explanation is a lot of little droplets or bubbles stuck together by the like-like-like mechanism and giving you these. And so, uh, it, whoops. Um, yeah, it's because of the lighting. You can't see. This is an oblique view, and if you were able to see it, you can see uh, you would see the mosaic here. And, and what I wanted to show you is that the dark regions of the mosaic extend downward. So we're talking not about a surface structure, but a structure that penetrates down into the liquid. It's like a tube. And so uh, this looks really weird, but it's the best interpretation that, that we have, that you have this mosaic structure that extends down. And what evaporates is something that looks like a tube, probably made of a lot of little droplets or bubbles. And if you were to take a, a, a plane through this, one, one image uh, using a, a laser, you'd see a ring. You'd see the kind of ring that we see. And as I said, you can take frame after frame after frame and get something that looks very similar. So it looks like what's rising up to give again, you can't see it, this ring-like vapor is structures that look like this. One may occur here, but nothing is occurring here. You see absolutely nothing here, but uh, some discrete event that's occurring here. So the evaporative process uh, might, this is obviously speculative, it looks like some kind of tube-like structures are rising to create the vapor. And uh, these tube-like structures give you this ring when you take a section through it. And the tube-like structure looks like it contains easy material of some sort, maybe real uh, extensive easy material, or more likely bubbles or droplets that contain easy material around and stick together to give you this. Then they disperse as, as they come up, giving you the raw materials for clouds. This is a discrete event. And you can, you can see this if you just look at your tea or coffee. You can see puffs of vapor that, that come up. And so I think that what you see when you sit with your cup of coffee is possibly explained by the mechanism that I'm talking about. This is now under discussion and consideration in our laboratory. So to recap, the non-liquid states, I think that the solid state might be an easy to ice transition. Uh, that you need to go through the EZ phase in order to get to ice. The two structures are very similar to one another. And that the vapor state might be an EZ tube that rises up to give you a, a, a tube, a vapor tube transition. And so the main point is that this exclusion zone, uh, if any of this makes any sense at all, is a necessary intermediate in all of these processes. And if you, if you ignore the presence of these zones, you'll never get the right answer to figure out how evaporation occurs and how freezing occurs. So why is all this important? I think it's possible that this exclusion zone could provide a, a kind of uni uh, foundation for understanding so many different phenomena of water. I, I barely touched the surface because there's so much to say. Um, and I apologize for the speculative stuff at the end, but I'm sort of excited about this and thinking about it. And feedback is, of course, always welcome. Much of this will appear in a book that I hope will come out in, in uh, six months or so. So anyway, we've learned a lot about water. We've, this has been going on for about eight or nine years now since we started doing experiments. And we've learned a lot, and a lot of postdocs and visiting scientists and graduate students and undergraduates uh, all come together to, to, to study uh, the nature of, of this material. And they're all deeply immersed, you might say. <laughs> uh, and so is, uh, so, OK, anyway, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for this nice talk. Questions? Oh, well, yeah. Oh. Um, regarding your explanation for where the energy comes from, from infrared radiation around the lab and such, you presumably need a, a heat sink too. So. Uh, I suppose if the experimenter is standing right next to the apparatus, the body temperature of the experimenter is probably greater than ambient temperature, but um, it seems a bit chancy here. I would have, might have thought that the uh, infrared from the walls would be just at the equilibrium temperature for the apparatus and that it wouldn't do anything. Uh, well, um, yeah. Uh, uh, um, 
you certainly it certainly will influence it. You know, if if you're um, if you're standing if you're standing uh, next to the preparation, um, we've noticed that uh, you actually can influence it. So if you look at the, this exclusion zone, I I suggested it was stable. It's not really stable. It it will increase and decrease and change with time. And the question is whether you yourself uh, standing next to it will will exert some some influence. And uh, well, um, uh, this could be responsible. Actually, there are many kinds of energy that we found. I didn't have time to discuss it that seem to influence it. And some I'm sure we don't we don't know about because the changes are legion. Uh, it's not really stable. And one of those is is <coughs> sound and ultrasound so again you're emitting sound also and and so um, if we put an ultrasound uh, transducer and turn on the ultrasound this is seven and a half megahertz same as used for imaging of embryos you put it in a chamber you turn it on and the first thing we notice is that the exclusion zone gets smaller it seems to erode which you might expect because of the friction of the sound and such however as soon as you turn it off it grows, it grows past the control value and it may grow five, six, seven times bigger, stays that way and then comes back again and gets, goes to the control, completely reversible. We've tried sound also and the sound seems to do something but th those are very preliminary so I don't want to say anything for sure. We've tried RF energy and RF energy does something uh, to it. Again, not so simple, we don't really understand but it seems to affect it as well. Microwave energy a lot of different energies seem to have some impact on this. So it's only, we're only at the tip of the iceberg of understanding. Um, and so we really don't know about all the energies that are responsible for creating it, but some kind of energy must be responsible. And, and the experiments I showed you there suggest that, that the, in the infrared range, that's much more important than anything else. Yeah, I guess um, just following up from the same question, the, the distinction between equilibrium and steady state, um, this concerns me. Um, you, you put some evidence there of a continuous flow. Now, I'm just trying to understand this. So energy is coming in from some power source and it's causing motion. Now, what happens if you exclude the power source, if you, if you seal this container or something? Does it still flow? I mean, does it... Is it an equilibrium state or is it a state? Okay, you, you know, if you had asked the question last week, I wouldn't be able to answer it. But uh, two or three days ago, we got results finally from putting in, we, we uh, put the system into a doer, a typical liquid nitrogen doer uh, that's going to block much of the infrared coming in. And sure enough, you, you put the uh, preparation in and the student who did it, did it unfortunately for an hour, too long. But when she pulled it out immediately, the exclusion zone was always smaller than when she put it in. Uh, I think five minutes would do it, but we don't know that yet. So the answer is yes. If you eliminate some of the energy, the thing withers down. So, so you're really not looking at an equilibrium phenomenon? No. No, not so, at all. So this is, a, this is a flow situation. With, That's right. With it's a, it's a steady state. Which isn't and, and what's causing, I mean, when, so when you've got energy coming in from the, from the sun, for example, and you had this flow through this tube, uh, presumably then you're causing dissipation and you're causing heating. Um, I mean, it doesn't seem to me where is the energy going. Okay, I, I, we don't know for sure. However, we have a hypothesis. Okay, and, and that is some elements of the hypothesis are verified. You have a tube. Inside this tube, this is a naphion tube or a poly, and we know that there's an exclusion zone inside because we've measured it many times, right? An annular exclusion zone, which is negatively charged. In the core of the tube are all those protons. Okay, so now if you look at the longitudinal tube, you know that in the core is just filled with protons. Yep. Now those protons want to go somewhere because they all repel each other. And so outside there are no protons, so they're either going to go this way or this way, or sometimes they don't know which way to go. And we found in 30% of the cases we get no net flow. You, you get a circulation. I mean, you get a circulation. circulation right. but, but the energy must be going somewhere. Well, the energy, yeah. see, yeah. our hypothesis yeah. is that the, the energy is, is being absorbed yes. by the system from outside to give rise and to maintain this exclusion zone and to create this continuous separation of charge. If you cut off the energy, you won't have the separation of charge and the phenomenon should, but should that stop. But once it reaches steady state, then it shouldn't matter. I mean, well, well, no, because uh, what's going to happen is eventually you can't maintain the charge separation 
indefinitely, or but entropy it, increases. Once it reaches that state, it doesn't require any more energy to maintain. No, I think it I does, mean. because I think you have to counter the dissipation or the, okay. the annihilation so of charge. So there's, so there's some sort of entropy reduction that's associated right. with that's right. formation of the yeah, structure. Which, okay, that's right. interesting. Which links me to this yeah. meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, well, I, I said it didn't stop, but it does stop. It goes for an hour or so, and after an hour, it starts slowing down, and usually it stops within 1.5 hours. And so the question is why, and I think it's a technical issue. You get so many protons outside that there's no gradient anymore between the inside and the outside, and that's what happens. And we have yet to try it with big chambers, which should reduce that effect. We don't know yet. We try that. We try that, and it always flows. Let's see, from the large to the small. Yeah. So, well, I'm sorry. I can't remember. I'm sorry. We tried experiments, and we got a result, but I don't remember the result. But it definitely does do that. You can actually, there are several different regimens of flow that we found, very peculiar flows. Uh, you take, uh, for example, I didn't show them for lack of time. You take a bead, a gel bead, and it has a spherical exclusion zone. You put it in a chamber with water, with microspheres, and you find that on the upper surface, all the water from every direction moves toward that bead, radially toward the bead. It comes toward, and then it bends down again around the exclusion zone and comes down to the bottom and keeps circulating. And we see that every time. We see that with, with um, um, uh, many different types of sphere, microspheres, many different types of beads, different temperatures of the chamber. And it's consist the consistent fact is it runs along this exclusion zone. So I think it's possible that all of these flows are due to charge gradients. And so if you go back to, to the vertical flows that was, were discussed before, I think a much more likely explanation for these vertical convections is not a difference in temperature or a difference in density, but a difference in charge. Difference in charge is really powerful in driving flows, especially if the charges are right on the water molecule, as in the hydronium ion. Then you have a tremendous force that can move, move molecules every which way. I think this is a central issue for biology, where inside of cells you have all kinds of flows that nobody really understands. This comes naturally. Also, if any of you know about biology, there's something called a proton pump uh, in mitochondria. This is a proton pump. It comes naturally as a gift of the energy from the outside. It just pumps protons. It accumulates protons. So, OK. Uh, on the subject of clouds, uh, I should also suggest that on the planets and moons, there are clouds of ammonia and methane and stuff like this, which clearly have very, very different chemistry. So I'd be doubtful if the exclusion zone idea applied so well to methane, which is a symmetrical, tetrahedral symmetric molecule, as it could to water. So uh, while I clearly accept you know, your experimental observations, I'd be wary about over-interpreting them all in terms of one phenomenon, yeah. just in case you do too much. Uh, I buy your, your uh, concern. We tried other liquids besides water. At first, I thought you know, water is central to life, and water is unique, and these things are unique to water. We found that's not the case. So we, we studied small uh, uh, polar liquids like uh, methanol, ethanol, DMSO, and we found the same. We found exclusion zones. And we don't understand them, but uh, they're smaller than with water, uh, but they also occur. And so we don't know the extent to which this phenomenon can be generalized. It's possible that other substances, well, we know that other substances besides water do this. How they do it, whether the molecular arrangement is similar or different, we don't know. But it's possible, I mean, this like-like-likes phenomenon is very simple and basic. And that phenomenon itself should have, I think, possibly wide application, although one can, can't be sure. So I don't know about the clouds on, on Mars and, and whatever, Venus. It's possible, but maybe not. Or for that matter, convection in the sun. Well, yeah, I mean, new stars have been shown to contain water. How recently? The sun doesn't. The sun doesn't. 
Well, um, I, some people say that the spectra coming from the sun are indicative of the presence of water. How or why or whether it's true, I have no clue. But there, there is that, that position. I can't support it, but I've heard it. My comment is very much in the same direction. A lot of the phenomena you have described, like those cells, those evaporation, you also see in substances like acetone, which are clearly nonpolar. And I think uh, the charge separation is one of the key mechanisms in your explanations, and those clearly do not hold in those other liquids. So. Uh, Good point. I, I'm not sure. We were surprised to find these cells in ethanol, for example. Uh, you can look at um, ethanol under the, for example, um, underneath the infrared microscope and see very similar to what you see here. We also used polyvinyl alcohol, which should be not charged because it's an alcohol group, and so we found similar exclusion zones. So you're right, but uh, I'm not entirely sure that, that there's not wider application. Not clear. So I have uh, one comment and one question. So comment is that generally uh, biological membrane are negatively charged, not yep. positively. If you yep. add positive charged lipid here, they're extremely toxic. Yeah. So it's well known. Another question is that... No that wasn't a question, that was a statement. No, this is statement. If you want a response, I, but go ahead. Uh, but the question is next. So normally bacteria pump proton outside, and then this proton comes in back, and this is classical mechanism of decoupling of energetic in the bacteria. In the mammalian, this is happening within the mitochondria. The point is that it pump proton outside, then it's proton used to go inside and used for biochemistry. If you have exclusion zone and proton comes out in the bulk, you can forget it. Because of course there's no way that bacteria can increase proton concentration in the Pacific Ocean. So it works only if proton not escape, or on, only on the close vicinity. But if your exclusion zone is exclude proton or immediately neutralize it because it has an extra negative charge, so in this case, I don't understand how this mechanism could work at all. OK, there are two points that uh, I'd like to respond to. The first is, is re really, it's really neat. The bacteria, basically, the bacteria is one big exclusion zone because the inside is filled with protein that, that builds this, this kind of ordered water and, and basically. And outside, of course, if you have a big exclusion zone, outside are going to be protons. And your argument is that, well, they're going to go way into the sea. However, remember, this exclusion zone is negatively charged. The, the protons are positively charged. Some of those positive charges then cling to the negative charge. They don't all disperse. Some of them disperse, but some of them cling. So you always have a ring of positivity surrounding the bacterium. Now, another question is, if you have an exclusion zone that excludes them, how do they ever get in, right? And I think the answer to that is, is that we found uh, in, in instances I haven't had a chance to discuss that sometimes there can be breaches in the exclusion zone, holes in the exclusion zone that basically form channels uh, through which through which the protons and other molecules can penetrate. Otherwise, it's impossible because the cell needs to communicate with the outside world. If the cell had a complete exclusion zone around it, it couldn't do anything. And so it's necessary for that to happen. And we found on, on actually membranes made of nafion or cellulose acetate, we could actually identify those, cha those, those, those channels through the exclusion zone. So I, I think that answers some of your questions, but obviously not all. Bacteria who live in extreme acidic, extreme alkalic condition. So they live in the alkalic test, pH10. Yeah. So if you have no proton outside, you have exclusion zone here, they pump proton out, yeah. get how the energetic works. The only explanation is that in reality, they think there is water which not exclude proton, not negatively charged, but keep proton here. Otherwise, we always have problem how to bacteria can change proton concentration in the Pacific Ocean. So in reality, you have to have a layer which is not exclude proton, and where proton can communicate along the membrane without going in the bulk. It's maybe the longer distance you get this fusion zone, but not in the real vicinity of the membrane. Otherwise, I don't understand how at all it gives these creatures of the extremal type. 
Uh, I think your question is too complicated for me to answer, but I would like to sit with you and talk about it because I think you're talking about some interesting stuff. Uh, I'm not sure of the answer, but I think need some more details in order to do it. I know that bacteria, for example, live in the Dead Sea. Um, and it's, it's unbelievable that, that the salt concentration of, for example, five molar or four molar, whatever it is in the Dead Sea, how these bacteria could survive. But somehow they need to keep the salt out. And an exclusion zone could do that. Uh, this is a very strange and weird. And then on the other hand, you go to the opposite extreme. You have jellyfish. And a colleague of mine, I think you're from Russia, Vladimir Voikov from Moscow University. Uh, perhaps you know, I don't know him. Anyway, he has done experiments on some jellyfish that are 99.5% water. 99.5% water. Almost nothing inside the jellyfish. It lives in the sea, and somehow it keeps the sea out. Uh, so these are I I extremophiles. These are examples of that something is going on that is very interesting that doesn't make sense. And you need some kind of structure to accommodate these, these extremes. That doesn't answer your question, but I think I have to sit and talk with you to answer your question. Okay. So uh, two things. Um, one, with the uh, steam coming off from your teacup, uh, so no, so you, you get swirls because of instabilities, right? If you don't have those instabilities, you get laminar flow. So it sounds like what you're saying is that your laminar flow would be rings or tubes. So you're a, kind of a tubular laminar. Yeah, flow. I mean is that that's what you're that's what the evidence is because uh, because because we can see a evidence for it. You can actually look at it, look at the, and you can see tubes. I'm sorry that one of the slides didn't show these structures that I showed you on the surface. These rings clearly extend downward, far downward, so they're tubes. So de facto, you have some tube-like structures that extend down. And then what we see in the vapor is we see tubes coming up because, because we see a, a, a ring rising, but successive images look just the same, which means that the ring has, is a cylinder that's rising. So that part is, I think, you know, pretty clear from the evidence, it doesn't require any conjecture. What the conjecture is, what are these materials made of? How do they arise? That's the, the, the question. But the facts are, that's what we observe when we look. So it's very weird. <laughs> and, and the second thing is when you were describing how ice is formed. Yeah. So you were saying that the reason there's this charge separation, so whatever this positive is made up of and whatever this negative is made up of, that there's a separation because of a lattice structure and this positive can't get into That's right. the lattice. Yeah. Right? So when the ice forms, I, I didn't, maybe I missed it. How does it get now into the Yeah, lattice? that's a good question. I didn't talk about it because it's comment? one step of, of complication. And I, I think what happens is, um, is that, the, 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 I'm sorry, I won't be able to give you a full explanation, but it's a hydronium ion to start with. And as a hydronium ion, it can't get in because hydronium ion is water plus a positive charge. That's too big to enter that lattice. However, a proton can enter the lattice. And so if you have a way to dislodge the protein from the proton from the water, it'll go right in. And it's drawn toward this huge negative charge that's situated in the exclusion zone. And so the mechanism involves building enough, enough of a charge concentration beyond the, the, the boundary that the positive charge here is pushing those positive charges that are stuck on the water off from the water. And once they're dislodged, they go right into the exclusion zone and begin to form ice. That's what I think might, might be going on. But that, would, but that would then imply that that happens more likely as the temperature goes down. Right, right yeah, but not zero degrees necessarily because, as you, as you know, it's not true that ice freezes, that water freezes at zero. It freezes anywhere between, between zero and minus 60 or 70 degrees, which is called supercooled water. But all that means is supercooled water means that there are situations where the water doesn't freeze at zero degrees. Very nice ex uh, experiment by some Israelis, a guy named Luba Mirsky. He put a pyroelectric surface next to water to see how it affects the freezing. Now, it, this could become negative or it could become positive. If it's negative, it inhibits the freezing. If it's positive, it facilitates the freezing. So in other words, they found that if you have a positive zone next to the water, it helps the freezing, which is consistent what, with, with what we found. And oddly, in order to get that positive charge right next to it, they had to heat this pyroelectric device. And despite the fact that they actually heated it, 
the ice froze more easily, the water froze more easily and at a higher temperature than if they had the negatively charged surface. So they concluded that the charge was critically important in, in, in all of this, and I think it is too. I think the reason why ice doesn't always freeze at zero degrees is that the critical variable is not the temperature. The critical variable is the charge. That, that's the reason why we have so-called supercooled water, that water, water freezes at a, a variety of temperatures. Or the heat could have added an instability. Yeah, it goes in the opposite direction, though. You, you'd expect that adding heat to it would prevent the freezing, but actually facilitated the freezing. That was the surprise in their, in their results. I wanted to ask a question about the, uh, the nature of... Oh, right here. <laughs> uh, the nature of the evidence for the, the source of the charge separation being infrared radiation. So have you um, looked at ab absorption in the infrared, for one? Um, have, have you got a candidate microscopic mechanism for how infrared radiation, you know, at one length scale can induce this phenomenon at a totally different length scale? And then finally, on, on the sort of speculative end of the section, if, it, if you do have those connections of different length scales, does this have anything to do with sonoluminescence, potentially, or, or not? Yeah, um, well, okay, you ask a lot of questions. Uh, so, so, first of all, with the infrared, uh, do we have a mechanism? We have a speculation. Uh, I think the speculation is that what the infrared does is it loosens up the bonds between bulk water molecules. And the reason, and allowing the water molecules to participate in the reaction that builds the exclusion zone. And the reason I think that, uh, and it's not a direct effect of infrared, but an indirect, which just loosens up the bonds between the water molecules. The reason is that we find that other sources of energy do the same thing. So it, it's got to be, I mean, facilitate the growth of the exclusion zone. So therefore, you'd think that it's something indirect rather than something direct. You'd think that all these kinds of energies must be doing something. And the, the only thing that made sense to us or makes sense to us is that somehow this loosens the bonds between the bulk water molecules, which allows the individual molecule to participate in the growth of the exclusion zone. That's a speculation. We, we don't know. The second is, it's not so clear um, that there may be a distinction between two phenomena. One is the growth of the exclusion zone, and the other is the separation of charge. The way I presented it to you, I said the two are one and the same. And I think as the exclusion zone grows, they are one and the same. But in terms of maintaining the exclusion zone, I think it's more likely that the UV, this 270 nanometer absorption that you find, is probably more likely to be responsible for the maintenance of the charge separation. We have indirect evidence for it. I won't go into it because it it, it just we haven't explored that enough, but I think that's a more likely uh, interpretation. Uh, you had another question, but I forgot what it was. Oh yeah, so so the um, um, you know some of you know about sonoluminescence, the great heat, uh, the temperature rise that when you put ultrasound you can see light that's coming and the uh, the presumed temperature rise is enormous some people have speculated i guess that the temperature that you can get is higher than the temperature of the sun uh, or something like this well you're basing that on infrared radiation and interpretation interpreting infrared radiation as being reflective only of temperature but as you know infrared radiation is the product of emissivity and temperature is not just temperature. And so if you get a change of emissivity, for example, if you go from one structure of water to another structure of water, that will give you a difference of infrared radiation. If you have charges that are concentrated, for example, like protons, as soon as you, you get protons that are created, these protons are moving around like crazy because they, they repel each other. And they're, you can see them, you can imagine that as the protons get released, they're repelling each other and you get tremendous movements. Well, tremendous movements of charge give you a huge infrared signal. So it's possible that what is usually interpre interpreted as a huge temperature increase could be nothing more than, than the uh, evolution of protons that are repelling each other and moving wildly around. I think that's a possibility. We have plans to study that, but we haven't gotten to it yet. It's a good question. OK, let us thank the speaker once again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.